Hello, everybody. Um, good morning. Uh, this is Jerry Wu, Associate Professor at the Georgia State University. I, on behalf of the Department of Kinesiology and Health, welcome everybody for attending the math lecture today. Georgia State University is an enterprising urban public research institution in Atlanta, the leading cultural and economic center of the Southeast. With more than 54,000 students, Georgia State University is one of the most diverse universities in the United States. Georgia State University has been ranked as number two for its innovation and undergraduate teaching, number three for fattest growing research portfolio, and number six for best first year experience in the nation. Our Department of Kinesiology and Health aims to discover new knowledge and advance the understanding of the role of physical activity in health and well-being, educate members of society and prepare future professionals, and also promote healthy lifestyles through lifelong activity and learning. The master lecture was generously established by Professor Emerita, Mike and Terry Metzler. The purpose of the lecture is to feature scholarship, research, policy, and the programs that promote physical activity for healthy living. Today, it's my great honor to introduce Thomas Barre as the speaker of the Maths Lecture uh, for this year. Tom is a former ESPN journalist and author of Game On, the All-American Race to Make Champions of Our Children, which has been used as a textbook across the country. Tom focuses his work on improving the U.S. youth sports system, in particular, increasing participation and expanding opportunities for recreational youth sports. Tom is the executive director of the Aspen Institute's Project Play, an initiative that helps stakeholders build healthy communities. The initiative's reports and data have shaped, shaped the national conversation about the value of sports for children and the gaps facing vulnerable populations. And hundreds of organizations have used Project Place framework to introduce new programs, partnerships, and grant funding to their communities. Today, Tom will give a presentation entitled How to Put Youth Back in Youth Sports. Before Tom starts his lecture, I want to remind the audience that this lecture will be recorded. I also encourage you to leave your question in the chat box during the lecture, or you can ask questions directly during the Q&A session after the lecture. So without further ado, Tom, the floor is yours. Let me start. Uh, Jerry, thank you. It's a great pleasure to be with you. I really, um, I really appreciate the invitation to uh, speak to everyone. I can see folks on the screen here. It's very exciting. Um, I'm from the Southeast myself, Florida. Is that okay? You know, so I grew up in Hollywood, Florida, and uh, now I live in California, still near the beach. Um, but, um, but yeah, terrific to be here. And let me see, I'm going to share my screen here in a moment. Um, this out here. Let me give you a sense of uh, what are we talking about today? Um, you know, the, uh, can, can folks see that? Good, Jerry. Uh, yes. Could you maximize in the presentation mode? Yeah, sure. How's that? In the pr presentation mode. Oh, presentation mode. Uh, is that this one here? Start from beginning. Uh, yes. There yes. we go. Good. That's good. Yeah. yeah. Terrific. Um, yeah. So what I want to talk to you today is about how to put the youth back in youth sports, right? Um, because we call it youth sports, but it's, it's really designed by adults for adults. And so I'm going to run you through the history of youth sports in this country and how we came to this moment where we're even asking this question and how to move forward from here. Um, and we'll leave some time at the end for a few for Q and A and, and your thoughts as well, because I've been marinating in this space for a very long time, <laughs> um, but I don't know everything, and I uh, and I'm really interested in in hearing the perspectives of folks who are on the ground in their own communities and and what they're seeing. So, let me kind of run you through it here. 
first thing you need to know about me is uh, my professional life is very much intertwined with my personal life. Uh, my fascination with this this topic um, really started when I was a father in uh, Connecticut, uh, outside of VSPN, Central Connecticut, uh, coaching. Well, actually, first just watching my son, my eldest son Cole, uh, play play soccer. You know, and he was on the sideline. I was on the sideline. He was on the field in a uniform at age, I don't know, four or five or something like that. And the parents are going a little bit crazy. And I started thinking to myself, wait, hold on here. When I was a kid, I played organized sports too, but I, but I slipped on a uniform around age eight. And even after that, most of my experience was probably unstructured, free play, going down to the park, making up basketball games, this kind of thing. Um, so I, I started to wonder how we came to this, how, how youth sports got so organized and so amped up so early. So, you know, I began to use the, the tools that I have, which are those of a journalist, um, to try and understand this. And it set me off into, into a journey that, um, that's changed my life and changed my professional career arc. I always wanted to be a, 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 a journalist, um, nothing but a journalist. Um, and it led to this point where now I'm running a, uh, have founded and you know, running a think tank out of the Aspen Institute. Where I do a little bit of journalism on the side, but um, most of it is just really thinking hard about how to build a better sports system in this country. <clears throat> um, there's an annotation request here. I should probably remove or delete it. Sorry about this. Um, I'll just decline because I'm not sure what that is. I apologize. All right, uh, next slide. I'm so sorry. Slide. There we go. All right. So, in the course of asking a lot of questions, I, I, I wrote a book back in 2008 um, called Game On The All American Race to Make Champions of Our Children, which is really a journalistic survey of the landscape of youth sports in America. And it was the first time this had really been done. I mean, there are hundreds of reporters, maybe thousands of reporters assigned to cover the NFL. I was once an NFL beat writer, uh, you know, various professional and college sports, but there's really no one assigned to cover youth sports, certainly from a holistic uh, point of view. You have people who cover high school games and so forth, but they're you know, just looking at the at the bottom of the iceberg, um, how it operates, uh, what are the key policies, practices, uh, partnerships, uh, outcomes, um, all of it. Nobody really done for it. So it took a lot of original research on my part to really get my mind around, get, get, get my arms around uh, what our sport ecosystem is in this country. We don't have a, a ministry of sports or a department of sports like pretty much every other nation in the world has uh, to, to, to really aggregate information. So yeah, a lot of work. But this thing went out the door in 2008 and really um, looked at three questions, you know, questions of access, who gets access to our system right now? Um, you know, uh, yeah, I started to see a model that had emerged where it was beginning to prioritize or had prioritized the kids who were from the upper income homes or the kids from uh, were just the early bloomers in particular sports. So what about kids with disabilities? What about the, the late bloomers? What about the kids who uh, you know, are from uh, disenfranchised populations? Um, what about kids who are refugees? What about just all sorts of kids who maybe aren't don't have the, you know, some of the privileges that uh, that. Uh, that other kids, other kids have. Um, I also was really interested in this topic of development. I mean, you know, um, how uh, an experience in sports might shape you as a human being, you know, academically, uh, cognitively, socially, emotionally, uh, et cetera. And then, you know, third is just really health. Um, you know, there was a lot of conversation at the time about the obesity crisis in this country. Um, it had really emerged. And so physical health, I mean, just, you know, what do we know about the benefits of playing sports and uh, where are some of the deficits we see uh, today? Uh, you know, now we have a, a real robust conversation around mental health in sports as well. So I broadened my concept um, to, uh, and the work we do with the Aspen Institute to really incorporate uh, mental health and social emotional health, which is closely related. Um, I am going to update this book. I've had a lot of people say, hey, what happened to a lot of the characters in the book? Because I was, inter you know, I interviewed a lot of, you know, 
kids who are four, five, six, seven, eight, you know, a kid who was, you know, the Callaway World Junior Golf Championships at, at age six and, you know, and, and a kid who was ranked number one in the country in basketball in fifth grade. I mean, whatever happened to these kids? And there's a, a lot of really interesting things and a lot of great lessons have, have emerged. I, I, I just got to, honestly, I just got to find the time to uh, put together a, a, an update on it. But it's coming, so stay tuned if you're familiar with it. So what I learned in the course of um, uh, researching um, for Game On was that we really, you know, there have been three phases of youth sports in this country. It hasn't always, we haven't always prioritized organized youth sports. This was something that really became a priority at the, in the first two decades of the 20th century, okay? So people like, you know, Teddy Roosevelt really believed in the value of sports and you know, building, you know, uh, building men and, and, and so forth. This guy was boxing at age, age 50 still. Um, and there were muscular Christians who wanted to, saw sports as a way to promote religion. Uh, there were child savers of the progressive era who saw sports as a way to, uh, you know, um, promote, uh, you know, get kids, get kids off the street and, uh, as a tool of social uh, uplift and mobility. Uh, there were military recruiters who saw this as an opportunity to build, you know, develop the next generation of soldiers. We were, you know, participating in the starting wars uh, around the world at the time, and there was a real need to kind of build the armies that were going to do this. Um, uh, you know, the, the the corporate titans of that era promoted sports. They saw it as a, a mechanism to promote uh, capitalistic ideas. There was a real conversation around communism and capitalism and what's, you know, what does it mean to be an American? So they promote it as well. So this is this incredible coalition of folks came together to really say, you know what, we're going to use um, sports as a as a tool of nation building. And so what they did is they began to invest. About two thousand parks uh, got placed in urban uh, communities across the U.S. in the first twenty years of the twentieth century. Uh, new sports uh, like basketball and volleyball, which were uh, invented out of, you know, whole cloth uh, just a few years earlier at the Springfield YMCA in Massachusetts uh, began to get promoted through mechanisms like the AAU or or, or, or otherwise. Folks like Luther Gulick, uh, who some of you may be familiar with, uh, you know, was, was very central in taking these sports and, uh, you know, creating a, a, a national footprint and, and pushing them around around the world even. Uh, thirdly, and quite significantly, um, sports began to get baked into the uh, into the concepts of schools, uh, and this was a uniquely American thing. We had seen this at, at the university level, but at the high school level, and the middle school level, and the and the grade school level, this is wholly new. The idea that you know uh, playing sports, being physical, physically active, was part of the mission of a school, and so we began to build out the infrastructure around it. PE teachers and um, you know, the schools began to just, uh, you know, run with this idea that uh, was sort of the early version of whole child development in many ways. Um, and that began to lay the, the, the groundwork for, for uh, you know, the model that we have today. The next phase of youth sports really became, uh, came along with the New Deal investment, right? So we, you know, fell into the Great Depression and, uh, and, and, and so a lot of money was invested in building gyms and pools and other community infrastructure around the country, an array, you know, it, you know, all communities, uh, a wide variety of, of infrastructure as, as well. And um, we also saw the rise in the 1930s uh, and 40s coming out of World War II uh, of, um, of, of volunteer led youth sport organizations. So schools at the, at the elementary and the middle school level began to get out of sports. So, you know, there was a sense that this is just getting too competitive. Uh, this isn't what we, we signed up for and filling that void were these volunteer led organizations. Um, again, still a major feature, uh, both a, a plus and there are challenges as, with, with it as well with, with volunteers leading these, these organizations. But this was re this really laid the groundwork for the great expansion of sports coming out of World War II. The third is what I would call, roughly speaking, the era of performance incentives. 
And it didn't necessarily start out this way. It almost happened. It became along by happenstance. Uh, it, it, it really started with Title IX, you know, when, when Richard Nixon in uh, 1972, with a stroke of his pen, declared that, you know, um, uh, schools getting um, money from the federal government um, could not discriminate in the provision of educational experiences. Sports is part of the conversation, but it wasn't front and center. I don't think he or anybody really knew exactly how this would reshape the, the sport ecosystem and, uh, and, uh, and motivations uh, of various stakeholders within it in the coming, coming uh, you know, decades and, and, and generations, really. But, but what that did is that opened up the door for, you know, uh, girls to play sports at scale. And it was really an act of participation simply through non-discrimination, right? Um, it wasn't actually an investment of any money. It just again it said you 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 know you you have to make a, uh, opportunities available to 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 girls. They were they were not really enforced in the 1970s and the 1980s. They began to get enforced in the 1990s. They uh, it, it really took off. Um, uh, at the same time, in 1978, another major policy adjustment. So the Amateur Sports Act was put in place. This was uh, done in response to the uh, to the to the U.S not doing as well as we wanted to do against Russia and East Germany and, you know, Eastern Bloc countries. We felt like we needed to kind of reorganize the governance, um, you, you know, of sports in this country. And so I've got a whole chapter on this in my, in my book. And there was a presidential commission that made a set of recommendations and there was going to be um, you know, funding for, uh, or for the entity that would, you know, for the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee, which which the Amateur Sports Act uh, uh, empowered, but at the last minute, in the middle of the night, they stripped out all the money and uh, and put the U.S. OPC in charge and uh, and the NGBs and gave them this mandate of really two things: one, you know, um, you know, uh, select our Olympic and our international teams, build out Team USA, you know, represent us on the international stage in a way that's going to make us proud, and number two, you know. Uh, tend to the grassroots, coordinate amateur sports activity. It wasn't real clear what that exactly meant, and it was a, a huge, you know, um, you know, a huge ask. Um, but again, it was unfunded. Um, and so over time, it's several, there were several things that happened as a result of this. First of all, it, you know, it, by putting the USOPC in charge of, of, uh, of, of, this coordination or this, this central role in, in governance, it kind of disenfranchised the AAU, which uh, was picking a lot of the Olympic teams. So the AAU went back and said, well, what are we going to be now? Um, and they reimagined themselves as essentially a, a travel, a, a youth sports tournament operator, uh, you know, really started in, in Memphis, uh, Tennessee with a man named Bobby Dodd. Again, I've got a chapter on this in my book. Uh, who said, you know, there's a great, there's a great opportunity here to throw these tournaments and families will come and, you know, we can make money from, you know, admissions and registrations and, you know, get a cut from hotels. And uh, it became a money making operation because the AAU had to, had to recast itself. At the same time, you know, the, 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 the NGBs uh, and the U.S. Olympic Committee uh, really, you know, they did try to take the the mandate to, you know, coordinate amateur sports uh, seriously for a little while. They had, you know, Olympic festivals. They had, um, they funded research. Uh, but then in the late 1990s, George Steinbrenner uh, uh, took control of, uh, of the, well, there was a Steinbrenner commission that, um, again, sort of a panic and we didn't do as well in the Olympics as we wanted to do. Uh, and, and, and you began to see this messaging coming from the USOPC uh, about how we can't, and they would say this to Congress, we can't both get people off the couch and get them onto the podium. We have limited resources, uh, you know, um, and we need to just focus on one of them, and it needs to be this. Over time, that um, began to shift uh, even further. There were, you know, performance bonuses for executives at the USOPC around, you know, metal count and, um, and so forth. And so the, so look, I know that I know the folks who, who run the US OPC, they're, they're all good people, but it, but the, the, over time, it just became a, a situation where it became very much focused on elite, uh, performance and, uh, medals. 
So, you know, and what happened there is as they stepped out of the space, again, the private recreation um, uh, space really began to uh, emerge. We began to see, uh, the, you know, um, the rise of private clubs and sports tourism, the development of these so-called mega facilities around the country. And we also saw um, it, was, it was fueled by the chase for the for NCAA athletic scholarships and preferential admission. So again, Title IX played into it. There were more opportunities and parents saw this. College became much more expensive. They have a little kid who's, you know, you know, eight, nine, 10 years old. They look like they're pretty good. Hmm, maybe if I can get them on the club team, they can get into the pipeline where they get looks from college, college scouts. Maybe they get a scholarship if you're from an upper income, you know, or, or you know, uh, upper middle class family. Maybe you got college paid for, but you know, if they're if they're, if they're a recruited athlete, maybe they'll get preferential admission to uh, select colleges. Hence the varsity blues uh, situation that we saw uh, that the FBI is investigating and is now in the courts. So um, anyway, none of this was designed. This is all just sort of like a set of uh, actions uh, that were unleashed that created the sports system that we have today. So I saw all this happening when I wrote the book, I did the lecture tour, and when I went around the country, one of the places I spoke was the Aspen Institute, uh, which I didn't know much about at the time, um, but I was impressed by their ability to be a convener uh, and reach into a lot of important places and get folks around the table and facilitate a conversation, help me facilitate a conversation around building a better support system in this country. So it was very compelling to me. And my interest began to shift from ESPN, which I loved my job there, to building up this, this founding and building up this program at the Aspen Institute. Um, it's actually the Sports and Society program. Project Play is the signature initiative of it, uh, which is really designed to address the problems that were laid out in, uh, in, in Game On. So Project Play is a, a multi-stage effort to provide stakeholders with the tools to build healthy children and communities through sports. It's a big bite. Uh, it's a very complicated. It's an oil tanker that, you know, <laughs> it requires a lot of work to turn, but um, we've been at it for a while now and, and seen some, some good things happen. Step one in reimagining sports in this country was simply to build a framework, um, some kind of shared vision, set of strategies that everyone could rally around. So this is what we put together in 2015, went out the door with the blessing of the uh, the Surgeon General at the time, who's the Surgeon General again now, Dr. McMurthy. Um, and it is really the, the first framework uh, at a national level on, on how to grow access to quality sport activity, regardless of zip code or ability. We're very clear about what the core values are, which are health and inclusion. There are lots of reasons why people want to play sports, you know, community development, uh, you know, chasing scholarships, whatever. We're like, no, I mean, the, 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 the strategies, nothing wrong with any of that, but the strategies that we're going to really focus on, elevate, are tied to health and inclusion. Um, uh, you know, are these policies, are these practices, are these partnerships that are going to promote individual health and public health? And are these policies, practices, and partnerships going to promote inclusion, meaning, um, you know, uh, models that are going to make room for the broadest swath of the youth or student population versus just those kids who are the who are the best athletes or are from the uh, upper rank of homes who can afford the $300 bats and the $3,000 you know, club soccer fees and so forth. Um, it is a framework that is agnostic, uh, sport agnostic. So like we're not just trying to pull one sport or, or, over another. Um, we do have data on the impacts um, of, of playing different sports. We, we, we know, you know, which of the top 10 sports played by boys and by, by girls uh, are most beneficial in terms of promoting physical activity or psychosocial outcomes or injury rates. Um, so, you know, we're, we're very, you know, we, we really believe in, in, in gathering data and, and using that to guide decision making. But look, sports is good, especially when served up well, right? And so the, the playbook has eight strategies for the eight sectors that touch the lives of children and, and initially had 40 plus activation ideas. And we have developed and pumped many more into the bloodstream. 
since then. You can find the uh, find the the the, uh, the framework uh, at that uh, URL below. Um, you know, I felt like it was we had to be we had to have like a shared vision that everyone can rally around. And this is the one that uh, that made sense to me, which is that we envision an America in which all children have the opportunity to be active through sports. Very carefully selected words, you know, active through sports. Because um, good things happen when bodies are in motion. And so the eight plays or, or strategies that we, uh, that we pumped into the bloodstream at the time were really, uh, none of them are rocket science. Um, all of them are designed to get the he heads moving up and down so they can begin to create policies, practices, and partnerships that are, uh, uh, that are going to be uh, beneficial. Um, the first one um, that we talk about is uh, called Ask Kids What They Want, right? And so, again, youth sports is designed by adults for adults, um, well, meaning adults, but it is designed by, you know, it's, it's a bunch of uh, parents, often dads, sitting around the Little League board table or the youth soccer board table in a community and deciding what their competition structures are going to be or how long the season is going to be or when they're going to start travel teams or, you know, what swag there's going to be. Um, and and what they don't do is they don't bring the voice of children into the into the uh, design of these experiences. Um, and then we wring our hands when kids spend so much time playing, you know, FIFA or Madden. And, you know, I spent very little time blaming technology. They have a role to play. They need to be responsible players. I get the whole conversation. But, 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 I, but I encourage you sport organizations and leaders to really uh, learn from the technology sector about what they're doing to uh, uh, effectively engage kids and create these sticky experiences. And what they do is they create competition experiences that are pretty much exactly what kids want. If you watch a kid play, play FIFA, like my son does, there's lots of action. There's lots of access to action. He, he can start and stop when he wants. It's often a social experience because they've got, you know, either someone's in the room or, you know, on a headset or otherwise. Uh, there's plenty of room for experimentation. Uh, when you screw up, nobody yells at you. <laughs> nobody gives you a lecture on the on the way home. Um, you know, it's it's and 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 the reason it's such a sticky experience uh, and so attractive is these these technology companies. Um, they use feedback loops. You know, they know what's working. They know they're constantly watching what kind of experience uh, kids or consumers want, and they keep iterating on their, on their, on their product that doesn't happen in youth sports, uh, certainly at scale, uh, you know, surveys of, of kids, uh, before the seasons about what they want, what, what do they want to play and what form, what's the motivation for doing so, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, you know, coaches talking to kids and, you know, you know, in a, in a, in a personal kind of way about, about their goals. Um, we're kind of we're winging it, and we and we wonder why uh, kids uh, cycle out of sports on average after two point nine years, and uh, and are done by the average kid is done by age eleven. Um, we, we just we're just not we're not creating a good product uh, that they want. We're seeing that during COVID as well. What's interesting is the kids who are the center of the system, um, the kids from the uh, upper income homes, hundred thousand dollars or more, as you. Uh, we'll see from a report that we put out the other day, our state of play report, are the ones who have most lost interest in sports during COVID. So COVID shut things down. They stepped away. They're the ones who have the least enthusiasm to come back to sports. And to me, that says, yeah, you weren't giving me, you weren't, uh, you know, I had a chance to kind of take a break and assess and that's, that's, that's not what I want, you know, um, pretty telling. Number two is uh, reintroducing free play. You know, when we talk about sports in this country, it's too often about just organized sports. Um, free play is where kids develop, um, you know, an intrinsic love of the game. Uh, it's where they develop creativity. Uh, you know, we, we know this from the, the best soccer players in the world, the best basketball players in the world. They were not just purely trained in organized settings. It was a uh, an imagination, a, a love of game that prompted them to go out of the back 
backyard or in the in the driveway or whatever it is, and just just keep you know uh, developing their 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 uh, their skills, which they then bring into an organized setting. Uh, but it's really important to have uh, free play. When I look back at my childhood, that's why I'm, I, I, that's why I play sports today. I mean, I play. I live in California, so of course I play some beach volleyball, which I love, and I surf a bit. And um, and I think back, and it, it wasn't really my little league days or any of those kind of organized experiences that were most catalytic. It was, it was just like running around, being free, just imagining things, ha having fun as a kid. So we, you know, we've seen this real shift from or from from free play to organized play, and we've got to be super super careful about creating more of a balance. Nothing wrong with organized play, but free play is essential in building healthy children and communities through sports. Um, encouraging sports sampling is, a, is the third concept that we talk about, which really means two things. One is uh, exposing kids to a wider variety of sports than they're typically served up with. Um, there are probably 120 different sports out there. Most kids are given the option of, you know, three, four, five sports. Um, but, you know, that kid might be really interested in fencing or rowing or who knows what. So how do we more intentionally connect them to those experiences through sort of reimagining the role of the PE teacher as like a community sport chief who knows, you know, all the assets of the community can connect kids, you know, uh, you know, uh, to them uh, or uh, organizations, um, you know, working together more intentionally to, um, you know, to promote each other's sports. The other aspect of sport, encouraging sports sampling is just pushing back on this trend toward early sports specialization, which I'm sure, you know, of course, many of you know all about, which is this idea that you need to, you know, focus year round on one sport at a very early age in order to achieve some of the downstream ROI outcomes that are desired, whether it be the college scholarship or preferential admission to colleges or who knows, maybe a professional sports opportunity. Uh, the research suggests that's not, I mean, that can be done. We have our, our we have our, our stories we like to tell about those kids, the Tiger Woods is the Andre Agassiz and otherwise, but far more common are the, are the Roger Federer's or the Patrick Mahomes or, you know, the JJ Watts's of the world who played a variety of sports, developed physical literacy, a love of game. And then as they got into the teenage years, maybe sometimes even the late teenage years, decided to focus on one particular sport. Uh, they were fresh, their bodies weren't burned out on one thing. Um, so the fourth thing we talk about is revitalizing in town leagues, which means local community-based play, peer classmates playing with cat classmates at low cost with minimal transportation uh, challenges. Um, the, uh, you know, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Uh, some hold some of those thoughts. Fifth is simply thinking small, which means you know use the available play spaces in your community as wisely as you can. You don't always need to build a you know a full field soccer. Uh, you can do a little mini mini pitch in an urban community for a much you know uh, smaller dollar amount uh, that might get kids you know playing sports. Um, so or it's 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 it's. Uh, you know, in terms of the creativity, it's it's more shared use agreements between community organizations and schools. How do we systematize that and promote that a bit more? The sixth one is design for development, which really means nothing more than anchoring our sports system in the principles of age appropriate play. So six is not 16. You can't coach six year olds like you do a high school student. Um, you know, there is a progression. You know, math teachers know this. You can't teach calculus before you teach you know, certain other, um, you know, forms of math. Um, but there's this rush to, you know, ask more of kids at an early age, usually out of ignorance. This ties into the seventh strategy that we talked about, which is training all coaches um, and the key competencies in working with kids. So that's basic safety stuff, you know, abuse training, of course, it's, you know, CPR, it's, uh, it's first day, but it's also things like, you know, um, just, knowing how to communicate effectively with kids. I mean, do you, can you, can you meet them where they're at, you know, uh, psychologically, do you know, basic coaching principles? Um, and do you, um, and do you know how to, you know, uh, 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 hold a practice, you know, I mean, do you, do you know, I mean, do you know how to teach a first touch? Do you know how to 
help a child develop, you know, the sports specific skills. This is important. Kids want to get better. They want to have a good experience. So it's not just enough to be that coach who wants to volunteer and you know, whatever, get out there and roll out the ball and everybody. Kids actually want to get better. So how do you, how do you crack that nut? Either through training yourself uh, or by bringing in like high school kids, for instance, to, you know, to, to, to be uh, co-coaches. And the eighth is emphasize prevention. This really started um, under the recognition that parents became concerned about some of the health impacts um, of, of playing sports. Concussion was, was, was becoming a real issue uh, in sports like football and hockey. Um, and so policies and practices and partnerships need to be uh, put in place that would, uh, you know, uh, minimize the number of injuries that kids um, uh, would suffer both physical and, and mental. So how do we begin to like, you know, uh, you know, unlock these opportunities and make this more than a conversation that exists within the, the sport and recreation community? Well, I mean, one, this is a, an infographic that we spent a lot of time pushing forward developed by the American College of Sports Medicine, a project called uh, Design to Move, uh, which is from a few years ago. And this aggregates the stacks and stacks of research about the value proposition being physically active, um, which is that kids are you know less likely to be obese, they do better in school, they are more likely to go to college, girls have lower pregnancy rates, um, there are higher binge drinking rates for athletes, but you know, uh, so it's not all positive, but a lot of just great things, lower healthcare costs, uh, more productive at work, more likely to be active parents, and because you're active parents, you're more likely to have an active kid because you're a good role model. So this incredibly virtuous cycle can get uh, engaged if we can simply get kids off the couch and off their devices without running them into the ground. So this has been very effective at bringing new actors into this conversation. We also focus people on, on just like visually, what well, what does a good model look like? Um, so if this is sports in America where, you know, I don't know, 60, 70, 80% of kids get signed up for an organized program at a very early age. And then we start creating the travel teams and the kids are in second and third and fourth grade and start structurally pushing aside the kids who can't afford that kind of model or just are late bloomers or just have like a, you know, a, you know, a, a birth date that is not advantageous or 11 years young or 11 months younger than some other kid who's just, you know, bigger, stronger, faster and gets prioritized by the coach. How do we build, how do we square the pyramid? You know, where up through age 12, at, at the very least, uh, the focus is on physical literacy, which we define as uh, an ability, confidence, and desire to be active. The emerging research suggests that if that is the priority, then we will simply build a better model. You're going to end up with better elite athletes. You know, you know, the kid who wants to just maybe compete in high school, you know, uh, you know, get playing time on the soccer team or whatever. They're going to be in a better place and then the kid and then as they move into adulthood and they want to play on the company softball team or whatever else it may be. Uh, physical literacy, just having that base, uh, you know, promotes uh, sustained participation. The, uh, so, you know, there, we need to recognize as well that that some kids just uh, start sports later, you know, um, and and so. It's not just an, an enough to dress the entire system. You've got to be mindful about certain populations. You can see them there who just, you know, get a later start. Um, income matters. Um, you can see, uh, I won't move numbers there, but bottom line is that kids from upper income homes have greater access to sport than, uh, than other kids do. Um, so, you know, the one of the concepts we really push forward is this idea of uh, building an athlete for life. USA Hockey has done a good job with their American development model about what needs to happen at each of these three different uh, ages. Uh, I'm going to skip these couple slides because we kind of talk about these ideas here, but we're going to look at on time. Um, we try to really uh, get people to promote multi sport play. This is something that happened a few years ago a joint multi sport endorsement by a lot of the NGBs saying at least through age 12. We will, you know, prioritize multi-sport play and, and physical literacy. Uh, the good news is there have been a lot of organizations who've responded to Project Play. Hundreds have taken action. 
guided by the principles, uh, you know, leagues, the U.S. Olympic Committee, media companies have shaped their youth strategy. Um, the National Youth Sports Strategy, uh, developed by the U.S. Department of you know, HHS, um, it, it's good. And it, you know, Project Play was one of the resources that informed the development of it. Um, and we've gone into about 10 communities now. We've done these deep dive, 40 page, 50 page reports on the state of play in those communities. Uh, foundations have used our uh, report uh, and our local reports to inform grant making. Um, and we also have uh, international extensions now. And there's a project play in Mexico, a project play in Romania through the Aspen Institute. Um, we continue to push forward the, the value proposition here that if we can simply get more kids active, you can see some of the downstream uh, benefits, um, direct medical costs saved, uh, productivity, uh, you know, losses saved, and most important, uh, millions of years of life saved. So it's a phase four of youth sport. What do we want it to be, right? So we talked about the three phases before. There's three things you're going to hear from me and you're going to hear from our program uh, as we move forward. Number one is recognize the right of every child to play. Sport is, um, you know, we're coming out of COVID now where we've had these dislocations and we really want to um, encourage people to think about, you know, establishing that sport is not a nice to have. It does not need to be, it should not be segregated into just the entertainment sector. We need to start thinking about sport as a just a, a tool of human development, and that children have human rights, uh, a human right to a play, and that they need to have their rights respected when they are in the care of adults. Um, we have uh, we launched the, 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 the Children's Bill of Rights in Sports in August, and we continue to see, continue to see more on that, including at next week's Project Play Summit. And um, it's exciting. More than eighty organizations have endorsed this Bill of Rights. I encourage you to read, you know, the eight different principles in there. Um, it's all on the, the Project Play website. Second is, um, you know, building this better model for for uh, for youth sports. Is it, I think the key is enhancing the capacity of local providers. So that means, you know, the park and recs, the YMCA's, the boys and girls clubs, etc. Um, people are cycling out of these low local low cost uh, uh, programs very early, often because the coaches aren't trained. Or Parents perceive that they, it's an inferior experience to the travel team kind of thing. So how do we build up the capacity of the coaches, of the organizations to uh, recruit and, uh, and keep kids uh, involved? So maybe they don't feel the parents don't feel the need to jump to the travel team thing so early. Maybe we can keep them, you know, in a, in a local low cost experience until, I don't know, fifth grade, sixth grade. That'd be huge. Um, fourth would be funding community based play, right? So there's actually been some very good things happened in the past uh, year uh, as a result of the pandemic around this. Um, number one, one, the American um, rescue uh, plan, uh, the, the federal government, the pandemic response has unleashed a lot of money that is now being pumped into states and cities. Uh, and so local organizations can use that, local sport organizations can use that if they talk to their officials about uh, building up the sport infrastructure and the programs. We've also <clears throat> seen the legalization of um, sports betting in New York with a carve out specifically for uh, youth sports. It's not huge, but it is a carve out uh, and it is a model that other states can adopt. It's, it's an idea that we you know, conceptualized a couple of years ago and people rallied around, which is great. Um, so there are some real resources that can come into the community, also through something called the Land and Conservation uh, uh, Fund, which is now uh, funded uh, full permanent funding for the first time uh, since 1965. This is going to pump uh, $900 million a year um, into national parks and state and local communities, about half and half. Uh, so, again, matching grants for local communities. Uh, can we make sure that communities that are in need get access to that money? So there's, there are real resources that can be tapped. And fourth, um, building this better, better model, we, you know, I think it's, 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 it's time to have this conversation about embracing sports governance. We have this instinctual thing in sports, well, you know, we don't want regulation or otherwise, but look, every mature industry has some form of oversight, some level of coordination, some place to balance competing interests. And we saw what happened during COVID, uh, where all these organizations wanted access to fields. 
but they had no one to go to. So they're leaning on the state public health departments and the governors, and they don't have any institutional expertise, really, uh, nor do they have the capacity to deal with uh, um, these sports, you know, sports organizations. So it was it was a mess, and and, and it's still a mess. And I think there's uh, for us to get and keep more kids playing sports and developing through sports, uh, there would be benefits for all for uh, putting in place at the very least, like state level governance uh, that can connect the silos in a given state and people can come up with an idea of, of what good looks like and standards that can be adhered to. Uh, so, you know, we'll be, we'll be uh, informing that conversation as we move forward. So, yeah. And then finally, uh, look, we're going to cover all these topics next week at the, uh, at the Project Play Summit. It's free. It's online. Uh, we'll be back in person uh, five months from now in DC, but right now it's just all online. So if you'd like to uh, participate in that, you have the URL there. Back to you, Jerry. Thank you, Tom, very much. And um, I can certainly, this is virtual. So I, I think we can all give uh, the virtual class to Tom, and this is very interesting and stimulating talk and I, I can see that there's a huge interest uh, from the community and to work with your institute and to get the sport going and I think that's great. Um, so we have uh, uh, more than 10 minutes for Q&A and so um, if you have any questions please unmute yourself you can ask questions directly. Um, I saw a question from Nikki and I am also Kent. Do you want to speak up? Now I can read the question. Um, so the question from Kent Lawrence um, and uh, uh, great presentation and excellent strategies. Uh, any ideas of how we might shift some of the mindset around sports? And how many people view sport as a competitive outlet and then not a developmental one? Yeah, so that's a really interesting word, competitive. We think about this very hard. Um, I personally don't think competition is bad. I think competition is good. And I think the central challenge of the system is to promote as much competition among as many children as possible. What we need to get away from is exclusion. That's different than competition. So when you have, you know, what we have right now is an up or out model where if you have the money and you have the talent, then you have a sustained experience. Um, and if you don't, you get pushed aside. We need to move toward an inclusive model that promotes competition among the, you know, you know, the, the broadest swath of the population. Um, Another dimension of this word competition too is, is it's different than winning. And a lot of adults don't understand this. I think it's a real conversation needs to be had with them about that. Kids want to compete. If you notice, they will go hard. If they lose the game, they might even cry after the game. But five minutes later, they moved on. They, but the parents have moved on. The parents are still thinking about the consequences. I mean, that's where the, you know, the talk on the car ride home or at the dinner table and wringing their hands on, oh, we got to get you with a private trainer or otherwise. Kids want to compete. Humans, humans want to compete. But, but, but moving away from this environment that is winning focused, where that is the definition of success and that there are consequences to not winning is what we need to move away from. So that's what I would encourage is like, how do we develop program structures, competition structures that do not structurally push aside kids? And part of that is honestly holding off on the travel teams until fifth or sixth grade. Or, or otherwise. My favorite sports system in the world is Norway's. Norway has a children's bill of rights in sports and they've got you know, language in there about what is supportive of that. They have uh, no national championships for the age of 14, no regional championships for the age of 11. Now, it's a smaller country. It's the size of Minnesota. It's 5 million people. But they're, what they really try to do is create this, this, this environment, at certainly at 12 and under, where it's all about love of game. It's about physical literacy. It's about playing with your classmates. It's about social and emotional development. There's a time to sort the weak from the strong. It's not when they're 
eight and nine and ten years old, years before they've grown into their bodies and their minds and their dreams. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, so next question is from Mike Matzler. And so Tom, you have list a lot of uh, strategies uh, to get people or kids involved in youth sports. Um, so how are you going to measure the success of your like project play? Yeah, so I mean, we uh, we're very intentional about what KPI that we want to keep an eye on. We track them on a, on a regular basis, and um, you know, it, one is just participation rates. Um, you know, if if the participation is going up, uh, then that suggests that uh, things are trending in the right direction. Um, the percentage of kids who are physically active doing anything on an annual basis. Um, the percentage of coaches who are trained in key competencies. We collect this data again on an annual basis. And pre-COVID, we started to, we started to really see a, a tick upward, of a significant tick upward, um, in part because so many of the organizations that that, that we work with uh, begin to pro prioritize uh, coach training, creating the tools, pushing it out through technology, in some cases creating incentives and mandates uh, to, to, to get it done. So COVID disrupted everything. Uh, we'll see where we land now. And there's a high churn rate with coaches, you know, because parents, you know, volunteer while the kid's young and then they cycle out really quickly. So how do you continually train these coaches up? So those are some of the KPI that we watch. Um, we can't control those. And look, they're, they're, you know, I have a, I'm one person, I have a team of, you know, five or six people that I, that I work with at the Aspen Institute. All we can do is provide thought leadership. Um, and there are, you know, there are factors that are well beyond our control. What's happening with the economy, what's happening with technology, what's happening with immigration. You know, uh, kids who are Latino or sometimes, they're, you know, they're, they're afraid, their families are afraid to sign them up for organized programs because of, you know, deportation issues, fears or otherwise. So, uh, you know, Look, we, we can't control whether the numbers go up or go down. All we can do is track them, put them in front of people, and hope they continue to focus on uh, filling some of the gaps. Great, great answer. Um, so next question comes from Jackie Lam. Um, so you, uh, sorry, Daryl, are you going to speak up? All right. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hey, how you doing? I actually currently coach a group of 10 year olds um, and we have a mixture of um, very skilled kids and kids that aren't very skilled. Um, one of the things that I found successful in helping those kids that are <clears throat> not as far along as having them work with each other. Um, do you think um, that that's a good practice um, is to have those kids that are a little more advanced work with those kids that aren't, you know, being that they are classmates and friends and um, this will kind of kind of help them um, be more successful and want to continue to do the sport. Absolutely. I think it's a great idea. You know, um, okay. I think the key is, is, is how do you help those kids who are better help the kids who are younger? Right? Can you give them some tools, some some ways that they can be as effective as they, you know, as, as they can be. Um, I think that's a good model. I mean, look, in my book, I, uh, I talked to Colleen Hacker, who was the, uh, the sports psychologist, is, I'm sure she's doing now, a long time sports psychologist for the U.S. women's soccer team, U.S. women's hockey, et cetera. She's an incredible person. And she said, here's what you want with, with competition with kids. Um, you know, parents always think they want the kid to play up. They always want the kid to play with the better kids. But what you really want are a third of the time for kids to play up, play kids who are, you know, in teams that are better than them. A third of the time you want to play um, with, with kids who are at the same level. And the third time you want to play with kids or teams that are of, of a lesser level because it brings out different kind of, um, you know, uh, skills and ways of interacting you know, being being a team member. So I think there's room for like those good kids playing uh, and teaching the kids who are, who are younger. You are going to want to find environments for them to play with good kids at their same level and kids who are at a, at a higher level as well uh, as a means to keep them involved because, um, you know, you, you could lose them or you could lose their parents who are like, uh, my kid's being left behind. I want my kid to get better as opposed to just my kid helping other kids get better. 
Thank you. All right. Um, so uh, here's another question about uh, physical education uh, programs and uh, resources, because I know uh, there are a lot of kids uh, take like PE classes at school. And so um, is your program working with any PE programs and the resources and to provide further like physical education uh, for those kids and encourage them to play? Yeah, our contribution, again, we are, you know, we're, we try to provide the thought leadership to move the space forward. So one project that we are in the middle of right now, it's been a year long thing. It's going to continue into next year. It's called reimagining school sports in America. And uh, part of that is, is looking at the PE equation. So we've gathered data on how kids feel about PE, what they want from PE. Uh, we have uh, some of the top PE educators in the country, like Jane Greenberg on our advisory group. And, you know, we are looking at schools that are around the country that are doing PE effectively, most effectively, elevating it, wrapping it around storytelling. And then next year, next March, um, at the Project Place Summit, we will release the final report in the Reimagining School Sports Series. And in there, you can expect that we will have recommendations about uh, what you know, how to, you know, how to do PE, how to build a 21st century model. What's the role of PE in building a 21st century model uh, for sports that engages the broadest swath of the student population? Personally, I think there's a huge opportunity to kind of reimagine the role of the PE teacher. Again, to be less of like a pure provider of experiences and more of uh, kind of a community sports chief. That person who sees all kids in the school knows what their needs are, um, and also has a sense of the community organizations, including those that abide best practices, uh, respect the rights of children, uh, have their coaches trained, uh, this type of thing, and then intentionally connects them to it. So in some cases, the school can provide the sport experiences, but a lot of times they can't. So rather than expecting the PE teacher and the school sports program to do all of it, how can the PE teacher be that, that you know, that person who sits in the middle and can, is more of a connector than anything else. So I know it's a big shift in how we think about PE teachers, but I'm sort of excited by that idea. Great. Um, well, another question is about that, like training coaches. I think this is one of your strategies. And um, so here's a comment from Nikki. And so um, this comment is about like uh, the, the position of the coach. Some coaches think that they are the star of the soccer team, not the players. So um, for your institute, uh, are you going to develop any guidelines or any regulation or any kind of organization try to um, train the coach and, and have the same common rules, like how the coaches should do, what they should do in terms of promote the youth sports? Yeah, so part of the Children's Bill of Rights in sports is that, is that children have a right uh, to qualified adult leaders. That's honestly, that's kind of step one, you know, moving from this environment where, you know, anybody who wants to coach can coach and we don't like ask anything of them to, to an environment where there's an expectation, where there's a, a tipping point where the culture expects coaches to be trained in key competencies. You know, and step two is defining those competencies. <clears throat> so we've, we've, we've gone about that, you know, as well. It's, you know, it's the stuff I mentioned earlier about safety and sports specific skills and knowing how to effectively communicate, uh, you know, coaching philosophy with, with kids. Uh, the next step beyond that is, um, you know, creating more tools. There are tools that are out there right now um, and, or are being created as we move along. Um, but then having this conversation around um, mandates. Uh, that if you're going to coach a team, then you need to get this kind of coaching or and or incentives. So, you know, if you get this coaching, then you'll receive whatever, you know, a voucher to do this or a tax break or uh, some some kind of benefit for, for these these volunteer and uh, and paid coaches. That's the only way is having the having been clear about what we want folks to be trained in key competencies having the tools in place and the incentives and mandates. If we can do that, if we can move this uh, environment 
to a place where most coaches are trained in key competencies, then I think, uh, and, and parents, and parents, especially entry level parents who are putting their kids in sports for the first time, have this expectation. They can begin to demand uh, quality. I don't mean in a mean kind of way because sports parents may be out of control, but but you know they under they, they're clear on what 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 kind of experience they want their kid to have. Then I think we can shape we can shape the environment, but it's not going to happen overnight. Okay, thank you, Tom. And I think right now it's 12 o'clock. Um, so this concludes Tom's presentation and Q&A session. And thank you very much for everybody for coming and attending the lecture and for supporting our lecture. Um, so uh, Brett, would you like to stop recording?